really came from me asking myself the environmental a question. field was to say, why are we still seeing this decline in the state of our environment, the loss of nature, the destruction of habitats, the release of greenhouse gases, when we know so much about the problems that this is causing? Because it is not for a second for a lack of science that we now um, are wanting in terms of moving to a different relationship with the world that sustains us. It's actually much more about the world view that we have in approaching the problems that are now uh, reaching crisis proportion. And I would characterize it like this. I would say that we've fallen into the trap of seeing the destruction of the natural environment as really the price of progress. Does that make sense? Do you all kind of recognize that point of view? We have to strike a balance between growing the economy, reducing poverty, increasing industrial competitiveness, keeping prices low on the one side. We've got to balance all of that against looking after the tropical rainforests, the endangered species, keeping our rivers pure and all the rest of it. And when you do a balance, what is it? Is it going to be the rare bird that takes priority or is it the economic growth and development? Well, we all know the answer to that. And so it struck me as being quite important to challenge that world view and to come back with a counter view that said, actually, no, that's wrong. It's in fact the opposite, which is the case. If we don't look after the environment, economic growth and development will soon come to an end. And that's why we have to restore the environment. That was the basic thesis. And actually, if it's science that we're interested in, there is a vast amount of it out there that confirms that alternative view, a different reality to the one that we've become used to. We have to protect the environment in order to protect the people. That's a very different political proposition to the one which currently drives behaviour decisions and the way the economy works. So where do we begin with the story of how nature underpins our well-being and what's happening to nature as the uh, story that needs to be understood. Well, in both um, of these books, What Nature Does for Britain and What Has Nature Ever Done for Us, I start beneath our feet in the dark world of the soil because the soil is very illustrative and actually helps us to understand um, a, another failure of perception, and that's regarding the way in which our environment is changing at scale and also over time. And because of the large scale and the time scales involved, we often don't see what's happening. But actually, if you stand back and look at what's going on in relation to that uh, fundamental world of soil, you can actually start to see some really big things unfolding. So one story that begins this book regards the flight of the International Space Station over Britain in March of 2014. The International Space Station passed over at 300 kilometres up traveling at 700 miles per hour, and it was delivering live pictures onto Channel 4 television. And this was at the end of a very wet winter. Extreme rainfall had affected the British Isles, probably linked to climate change. It was so extreme. And you could see changes in the natural environment as a result of that, but only from the perspective of space. One of the astronauts on the space station was giving a live commentary to British TV viewers, and he just remarked on the colour of the ocean around the coast of southern Britain, because the space station came over bright blue sparkling water in the Atlantic. As it crossed over Land's End and came across southern England, the astronaut just said, run off. He was pointing with that single word to a brown fringe around the coast of southern Britain, and that brown fringe was millions of tonnes of topsoil that had left the land and which was in the water around the coast, especially down the estuaries of the major rivers, the Severn estuary and the Thames estuary. And that brown fringe was basically farmland that had left the fields, travelled in ditches, gone into the rivers and had been transported into the sea, taking a vast quantity of pesticides and fertiliser with it, thereby causing damage to coastal habitats. So that was a large-scale change that you could see occurring at scale. Had that countryside from which the soil had left still been covered with forest, as was the case six or 7,000 years ago, 
there would have been no brown fringe. The brown fringe was as a result of the way in which we conduct agriculture and leaving fields bare in the winter. And on top of that was the effect of very heavy rain linked in turn to climate change. That's the perspective you get if you go back and look at the broad scale of what's going on. If you look at the soil in terms of a longer time period, that is the one that most of us tune into, which is really day to day, again, you can get a different message. And that message you can find in a very special place just to the north of here at a place called Holm Fen. If you go to Holm Fen, you will see the results of what is probably one of the more high impact uh, ecological monitoring experiments that has ever been done. Because up there in the 1850s, a landowner put a piece of metal through the peat in the Fenland that was then just in the process of being drained. Peat is unrotted plant remains, many of you will know. It accumulates in wet conditions, and it's a very special soil type that has all sorts of special characteristics. With the metal post th put through the peat, over time it was possible to see the changes that occurred once the water was removed from that particular soil uh, type. As the water was removed, the peat began to shrink. And if you go up there today and look at the top of the metal post, it's four metres above the ground, when in fact in 1853, the top of the post was at ground level. You can see our over several hundred square kilometres of Fenland ecosystem, the peat has disappeared. Now, it's not only shrunk, but also it's evaporated. And this actually then speaks of another property of soil beyond food production, which is about carbon sequestration. Because peat basically is made of carbon and water. And when the water is removed, the carbon in the unrotted plant remains, meets oxygen in the atmosphere, and it turns into carbon dioxide. And up in that part of East Anglia, and across many wetlands throughout the world, you can see that basically peat is turning into air and in a way which is helping the climate to change. Would you believe that across the world there is more carbon in the soils than there is in the forests and the atmosphere combined? And as a result of the way in which we're changing the way we use the land, we're putting more CO2 into the air, thereby hastening global warming. And of course, the other processes going on in the soil depend upon that carbon for them to be powered. The organic matter in soils is the fuel that drives the microbes that actually lead to the nutrient releases that enable plant growth. Miraculous interactions going on below ground by literally billions of organisms, even in a single tablespoon full of material. Go to the fens uh, or some of the grasslands around Cambridge, take a tablespoonful of healthy soil, especially from an organic field, take it into the lab. If it's come from a pasture, it will be teeming with life. Perhaps six billion microorganisms in that single sample. All of them working in ways that we barely understand. Ecological relationships that are sustaining a really complex system that in the end is sustaining agriculture. So the soils are fundamental in keeping climate change under control, and producing nearly all of our food, and doing that through ecological relationships that we hardly understand. And what are we doing to soils globally? Well, of course, we're destroying them. Why are we destroying them? For cheap food. Does the cost of climate change and the loss of our food-growing medium come into the equation? Not really. We still only look at it from the short-term, here and now, economic perspective, rather than from the longer-term or global perspective. This is a real failure of perception. Soil, healthy soil, is underpinning our civilization, protecting our civilization, and we abuse it in ways which are really very surprising. And of course, upon those soils are supported the habitats, or at least once the habitats, that sustained the biological diversity that used to be across this country, and indeed all countries of the world, but which is now already severely diminished. Woodlands, grasslands, wetlands, all of which are now down to tiny fragments of their original extent. In this country, about 2% of the original native woodland cover remains. 2%. That is really quite an incredible statistic. Actually, not quite as incredible as the fact that there's now only about 1% of the hay 
meadows which were rich in flowers that we had at the turn of the last century, back in the 1900s. Just 1% of that left. And when it comes to wetland ecosystems like the fens of East Anglia, just about one third of 1% of that is left. Wiccan Fen being one case in point quite near to here. Those ecosystems have been removed because we have intensified agriculture. This has been the principal reason why biodiversity has been in decline. And actually declines even in recent times, never mind what happened a century or more ago, are really quite incredible. A recent survey conducted by this country's environmental groups, RSPB, the Wildlife Trusts, WWF, Bug Life and the others, came to the conclusion that something like 56% of species in this country are presently in long-term decline, more than half, one in seven threatened with extinction, and that's on top of much longer-term declines that occurred before. The baseline keeps shifting, and each time the baseline shifts, we're declining from an already depleted base. So when you look at those figures, uh, bear in mind that we're already dealing with a remnant in terms of what we're looking at from the point of view of the continuing drop in numbers and, uh, uh, and distribution of some of the animals and plants that are being studied. The principal reason for all of this, of course, is, is land use change and the extent to which we now farm nearly all of the country's land area, 80% in some kind of agriculture or other, much of it really quite intensive farming of the kind you see in East Anglia, and also the country now pretty much split in half, whereas it used to be mixed farming that supported quite a lot of wildlife in the countryside until the middle of the last century. We've now split the country more or less into intensive arable farming in the east and intensive livestock farming in the west, both of them depleting the wildlife in different ways. Whereas we used to have a much more benign mixed farming system, combining animals and crops together in ways that supported much more wildlife. And on top of that uh, intensification of land use, we've also become uh, much more reliant on the use of ever more sophisticated chemicals, including pesticides like the so-called neonicotinoids, which have led to such big impacts on insect populations during recent years. And actually, if there's one trend which I find particularly terrifying at the moment, which is coming through the scientific literature, it's the collapse of invertebrate populations globally. And so a piece of research from Germany, published about a year ago, uh, told of a three-quarter drop in the population of flying insects, biomass, over a period of 30 years, and that was inside protected areas, thereby suggesting something really quite systemic changing. What is that? We don't really know yet, but you can see a similar pattern unfolding, not only in the temperate countries, but also in the tropical regions, with a study from Puerto Rico published a couple of weeks ago telling of a similar scale of insect decline, probably a combination of chemicals, of land use change and climate change on top of that with these things working together. Sometimes you think, well, you know, this is really the price of progress, isn't it? We're growing the economy, we're providing people with uh, more comfortable lives, maybe a few insects uh, is something to be tolerated, loss of a few insects is something to be tolerated. Well, actually, uh, bear in mind that our food security is not only dependent upon the uh, healthy soils which help nutrients to recycle through systems but also pollination by animals with insects being the principal group that is underpinning the 70% or so of crop varieties that are dependent on animal pollinators. So all of our fruit and vegetables basically it's the cereals that are wind pollinated. So if we wish to have food security into the future not only soils do we need to be looking after but also we might wish to be looking after insect populations including wild ones. And so these are the kinds of changes that are taking place at scale and now at some speed. And if you look at what that means in a global context, many of the conservation biologists who are looking at this would say that we're now approaching a mass extinction of wildlife on Earth on a scale that's not been seen for about 60 million years, just to put this into perspective in terms of the, the pace of uh, the alterations that are occurring as a result of human activities. And it's not, of course, just on land where you see some of these uh, changes taking place, but also in the sea. And it's not only land-based pollution that's causing this, as chemicals and fertilizers go down rivers and into coastal waters, but also the effect, of course, of the fishing methods that we use, uh, especially 
uh, seabed trawling, which have caused really quite major changes to biodiversity in many areas, which is pretty much the entire coastal waters of the world these days, that are fished for human food supply. And around the British Isles, the fishing with trawling gear over now getting on for 200 years has led to really quite profound changes to the seabed, including the loss of really major reefs, uh, like a major oyster reef that occurred once in the southern North Sea, covering several hundred square kilometres, but which has now completely disappeared. So these are really quite major scale changes that have happened, and they've happened quite quickly, and they've happened at a very large scale to the point where wildlife and nature now is really forced into a few special places where there is still some um, survival of the native biodiversity, but it's in um, still fewer places across the country uh, as the pressures continue to mount. And of course, the pressures don't go away. They intensify as more demands are required from the same land as the population grows up, goes up and the economy continues to grow. Now for a little bit of more positive news, because all of that we know very well. What we know less as a society is that we can solve all of these problems and we can do it in ways that are very good for the economy and for people. This is actually quite surprising news, but I think probably is the most important uh, message from this evening's lecture. I'm going to give you a few examples of things that I wrote about in this book. There are many others, but just to give you a flavour of the kind of thinking that we can now insert into this situation to start turning things in a different direction. First of all, I'm going to talk about um, a piece of work that is um, being undertaken by a group of organisations in the southwest of Britain, um, including Southwest Water, a major water supply company, uh, the Devon Wildlife Trust, a, an excellent organisation working on the ground in that part of the world, and the Southwest w Rivers Trust, amongst others, who are investing in a programme called Upstream Thinking. Now, why would you, as a water company, start investing in ideas which um, sound a bit of a, as though they're about uh, the whole river catchment rather than technology? Well, in the case of Southwest Water, supplying the needs of Exeter and Plymouth and millions of other people across that part of the UK, they need to be extracting raw water from the environment, cleaning it up, putting it into pipes and delivering it to people's homes. And in order to do that, they need quite a lot of technology quite a lot of machinery, quite a lot of chemicals, and quite a lot of energy to do that. And all of those things cost quite a lot of money. One of the things that they do is source water from a couple of upland catchments, Exmoor and Dartmoor. Those of you who know this country will know these as areas of, of really quite wild country. Um, but even though these areas are quite wild, they are heavily degraded. So Dartmoor is a beautiful place, it's got lots of archaeology, it's got some wildlife still hanging on there, but it's a place that has been heavily abused over a very long period. And not only has the place been grazed heavily by sheep and been burnt, it's also been an army and navy training ground. And when you put those kinds of pressures together on this area, it's led to really quite extensive ecological decline, because that part of southern England is covered with blanket bog. So this is a peatland habitat again. And in the case of this area, upland peatlands um, with a layer of peat about eight metres deep, covering these hills with effectively an enormous cloak of very wet, soggy habitat. It's like a big wet duvet. It soaks up the rain and stops the water rushing off the hills very quickly. And as it releases the water into the streams, then it releases it slowly and in a way where the water is running pure from the tops of the hills. Or at least that was the case until quite recently when the blanket bog had degraded to the point where the water was running off brown. As a result of drainage ditches being put in to facilitate grazing, as a result of burning of the peat, and as a result of artillery shells being fired into it, literally blowing it to smithereens, the peat was running off the hill as brown water. That brown water is no good for sending into people's houses. They don't like it. And so um, I'm trying to find a glass of water. Uh, oh, there's one here, look. 
That's how we like water, isn't it? If that came out of your tap brown, you really, really wouldn't like it. And Southwest Water knew that, and they knew it was also illegal. Question is, what's the best way of remedying this situation? Do we spend more money on more chemistry, on more pipes, on more machines, or do we try and repair the blanket bog? So they embarked on a program of investing in the repair of the catchment, reducing the numbers of sheep, blocking up the drainage ditches, speaking to the various landowners, including the army, who were beginning to withdraw anyway in terms of using the firing ranges up there to see if it could be possible to start to repair the ecosystem. And indeed, they found it was possible. And on Exmoor, they had spectacularly uh, successful results from very low-tech uh, methods using bits of peat that had broken off from the side of the bog, sticking those into the drainage ditches, putting a bale of straw in there to hold it in place. And within a few years, the bog began to re-wet and became covered with blanket bog vegetation once more and began to stabilise. And I've seen similar uh, examples in Northern Ireland where Northern Ireland water is investing in exactly the same kind of programme with a very rapid uh, beneficial effect coming back for not much money. And so the company, which is charging people for water, is able to supply the water to the people in a way which actually is going to secure it into the long term and do it more cheaply and therefore keep bills down. This is really quite an interesting example for me. When you think back, and I don't know how many of you remember this, I'm always quite attuned to the political discussion on these kinds of things. A few years ago, all the politicians were arguing about the need to get rid of all this green rubbish um, because it was putting prices on hard-working families' bills, including water. The idea was that we couldn't invest in protecting the environment because it was bad for water bills. No, the complete opposite is in fact the case in many cases, including this one. What was more interesting, however, when you start to look at the overall benefit of this kind of investment by water companies backing up the work of conservation groups and others, is the whole range of other benefits you get. The water company is regulated to provide water cost-effectively and safely to the public. They're not asked to solve climate change particularly, or to reduce flood risk, or to restore wildlife, or to protect other economic sectors. But as a result of doing this, that's what they did. Because those blanket bogs have got billions of tonnes of carbon in them. And when you re-wet it, not only do you stop the carbon going into the atmosphere, you start sucking it back in again. And that part of the southwest of England has suffered terribly during recent years from extreme rainfall events, stripping hillsides off, blocking up rivers, flooding people's homes and businesses, costing hundreds of millions of pounds in insurance payouts, causing misery for people as well as major disruption. When you start to hold the water in the hills by repairing the habitat, you reduce the flood risk. And then on top of that, the rivers start running more purely once more with clean water rather than water with carbon dissolved in it. The salmon and trout populations come back. Not only is that good from the point of view of conservation, that's a really important economic sector. And then, if you're a conservationist like me, and you start seeing the breeding dunlin and curlews and golden plover coming back, you think this really is proving the opposite to what we all thought, that looking after the environment is harmful to the economy. No, it's the opposite. So in the water supply sector, we can see many examples like this, and not only in terms of repairing blanket bogs, but also reducing some of the chemicals that we know are harmful to invertebrate populations. In this part of the country, Anglian Water, in the southwest as well, Wessex Water, are among companies that have been investing in helping farmers to reduce certain kinds of pesticides being applied to the land in order to not have to take them out at the water treatment plant. Would you like to eat, drink, slug killer? Not really. Mm. One way of avoiding drinking slug killer is to spend a lot of money removing it at the water treatment works. The other thing you can do is to spend much less money on advising farmers how to farm with fewer chemicals, saving them money, saving the environment, and still producing plenty of food. So these are the kinds of choices that are out there if we start to look for them in the right way. And also when it comes to uh, 
chemicals and the extent to which these are sensible to be deploying at such large scale. Another aspect of our security, not simply water security, is obviously food security and the extent to which we're growing food into the future in ways which are going to be sustaining the system that produces the food. Another example in here is that of Thatcher's Cider. Very impressive uh, company. Some of you may like their products. I do. It's a um, southwestern uh, company. It's based in Somerset, and their principal raw material is pears and apples. They harvest tens of thousands of tons of those fruits from orchards across the south of England, and they um, process them and turn them into uh, a product which is then branded and which has been, in the case of Thatcher's, spectacularly successful during recent years. During the course of writing this book and researching it, I went to meet Martin Thatcher, who's the managing director of the company, and spoke to him about why he has managed to grow his business by about 10 to 20 percent per year during the whole financial crisis. Maybe we were all drinking so much because we were all depressed, I don't know. But nonetheless, during a period of economic difficulty, he did manage to keep growing his business in a way which the politicians hopefully would think was very positive. And of course, that kind of growth many firms would only dream of. And I said, how did you do that? He said, well, he said, we're dependent on um, a, uh, a very good supply chain of, of others who help us, transportation, people who make barrels, the bottlers, the people who print the labels for the bottles. We've got a great brand agency. We've got a great logistics effort. We've got a really well-trained staff body. And then he said, the other thing we've got is bumblebees. I thought, now this is very interesting um, because uh, most companies wouldn't necessarily mention anything to do with nature in terms of the way in which their business thrives. But in his case, uh, the bumblebee is essential for the pollination of the apples in the springtime in order to be able to produce the fruit that then is turned into the cider. And I said to him, well, how are you managing to ensure that you've got bumblebee populations in the fields? And he said, well, basically what we're doing is we're putting in features, grasslands that we're leaving rough, we're re, uh, re-maturing the hedges, letting them grow out and become very big and very broad at the base. They're leaving the old uh, gnarled trees in the hedgerows rather than removing them for the sake of tidiness. Dead apple trees, they're leaving some of those in the orchard, and they're planting copses and putting in water features, all of which are designed to encourage insects. Now, most farmers you speak to, and most people you speak to who think about food production would think of insects as the enemy. The insects are not the enemy. In this case, and in many cases of, of agricultural uh, sustainability, the wildlife actually can be and should be integral to the process of producing the food. And in his case, he's rebuilt the populations of bumblebees, thereby getting pollination up and getting better quality fruit as a result. And speaking to him, he says he thinks he now needs to use fewer pesticides because what he's done as a result of uh, renaturalizing the orchards is to bring in many more songbirds and bats which are eating the harmful insects. So by recreating some sense of balance, the beneficial insects have been increased at the same time as the predators of the harmful insects have been put back as well. He doesn't have any data about the beneficial effects of bats and songbirds, but other scientists do, including a Dutch study which showed a really profound effect coming from great tits being present in orchards during the uh, early part of the spring when the fruit is being set Studies from the United States estimating the value of bats in terms of avoided costs on pesticides in the billions of dollars. These things are real. The pest controllers can be put back. If only we've got the mindset. Trouble is with a great tit or a serotine bat is that you can't put them on a balance sheet very easily. You can work out how many pesticides you've bought and you can look at the sales of the pesticide companies and you can look at the contribution to tax revenues from that. We need a slightly different mindset to be looking at the value of nature. We just need to be widening our view a little bit more and actually using a little bit more common sense as to how all of this works. Because ecology is real and it sustains our entire civilization if only we can begin to see where the dependencies lie. And those dependencies whereby ecology 
enables keystone species to exist in an ecosystem, like a bumblebee. Of course, that applies in the ocean as well. It's even harder to see it there, because most of us don't ever go into the ocean and go into the bottom of the sea and to see how the connections work. But they are just as real. And if you think about it, um, a cod can no more exist in isolation than a bumblebee can exist in isolation. And whereas the bumblebee needs insects, sorry, plants upon which it and other insects can feed and take nectar and pollen, so the cod requires a food chain to enable it to grow into the large sized fish that we find so valuable and which actually underpin one of our national dishes, cod and chips. And so if you think about the cod and the ecosystem that enables it to first of all eat crustaceans, crabs and other shrimp-like animals when it's small and to be eating mackerel and bigger fish when it's bigger, you have to have the whole ecosystem in good shape to be able to do that. And so a couple of things that we can see already being done around the British coast which show us that we can take a different approach there. One story which I found very inspiring was work being done by trawler captains in the port of Brixham in Devon. So for many decades they've been using trawl gear to get fish harvests off of the seabed in the process doing quite a lot of damage. They don't necessarily want to do damage, what they want to do is catch fish and make money and if they can be convinced that a healthy ecosystem will lead to more fish then they're up for discussing solutions. And one of the things that they were trialling themselves was putting wheels on the ends of their trawl beams. So a beam trawler has a great big piece of wood with the trawl nets running behind it, that bounces over the seabed except you can avoid that by putting wheels on the end of the trawl beam so it runs over the seabed, gliding across, creating two little tracks rather than smashing the whole system to pieces. That has the beneficial effect of not only catching fish without damaging the habitat, it means you use less fuel because you've got less damage, sorry, less friction with the seabed and you need to replace your nets less often because you have less damage by colliding with rocks and so on. And so that means the fishermen are making more money while causing less damage. That's actually quite a win-win, isn't it? And that's why all of the trawler captains now have adopted that technology on their boats in Brixham. And it was done because they could all see the benefit. They've now also moved to avoiding fish exclusion devices to avoid catching non-target species and also they're investing in new kinds of relationships with retailers like Sainsbury's so that all of the fish they're catching is being used rather than less desirable species we've never heard of being chucked back into the sea. So sustainable use of the sea can be a uh, reality as can the benefits that can be taken from protecting areas of ocean. And this has been an area of, of real contention in this country over the last 15 years or so, has been around marine protected areas and whether we should have more of them or not. And actually what we're finding now, having established some a few years ago, is that these places where you can restrict different activities that are harming submarine habitats can have a major benefit economically. So one where there is some data uh, is uh, Lime Bay, a major campaign by the Devon Wildlife Trust again a few years ago, managing to get a large area of ocean protected off the south coast of England. And this has proven to be not an economic hardship for the local area, as was predicted and claimed, but actually has led to an economic uplift as more tourists have been attracted there. And actually the fishing has continued, but outside of the protected zone. And actually the fish that are being collected and caught outside the protected zone are being replenished from in the area that is now set aside for wildlife. So we have many good examples of where we can harness nature for economic benefit if only we can adopt the right kinds of approaches. And that really brings me just to a final few remarks really about the future and the extent to which we can now embark on a different path. Because there are some things that are now happening that when I wrote this I didn't think they would be happening. I said they should happen but didn't expect that they would anytime soon. But actually now all of them are, which is really quite an interesting thing, which is why this is timely. So the first thing that's happening, and this is in part linked to the Brexit process, which is a whole other story, but actually we're about to see the publication of a major new piece of environmental legislation coming from the British government. Uh, my organisation, WWF, 
many others, um, the Wildlife Trust, of which I'm president, the RSPB, and pretty much all of the major conservation groups in the UK are now campaigning for that new Environment Act to have a major ambition in it that will re require governments over the coming several decades to improve the state of nature in the UK. That may sound like it's not that ambitious or not that radical, but we've never had that before. What we've had in the past is environmental legislation targeted on particular issues and meant to be restricting particular activities, but all that's done is to slow down the rate of decline. What we now need to do is to set in place a legal requirement for government now to recover the natural environment of this country, to be putting the bird populations back, recovering the insect populations, to be improving the purity of the rivers, to be rebuilding the resilience and health of the marine environment. And all of this can be done because I've just given you a flavor of some of the examples of what's already happening. There are so many thousands more examples, but those are just a few of the ways in which we can begin to see that we can start to turn the juggernaut in a different direction. So that act of parliament is really quite crucial. And I would encourage all of you to go to the WWF website and just find the campaign page there, inviting people to drop a line to their MP. We just put this into effect about 10 days ago, and we've already got a couple of dozen MPs saying that they will support this law to do what I've just described, to create a new ambition through a new act of parliament. The question will be, how are we going to achieve such a big ambition? And that's when we come to the different tools that we've got available. One tool we've got is a new farming policy. So whatever you think about Brexit, and I think quite a lot about Brexit, one of the things that I know could be an upside from this process is a new farming policy. One of the things that has characterized my entire career as an environmentalist in this country has been the disaster of the way in which we've encouraged our farmers to farm through the rules that have been developed in Brussels. We've encouraged intensification, heavy pesticide use, production of more food above everything else. It's been an environmental disaster. We now have a new policy, which is in Parliament right now, about to shift the regime into a different place, whereby farmers will not only be incentivized for food production, but for environmental recovery. So the three billion pounds we spend each year at the moment in Britain in uh, paying farmers for farming the land with no strings or conditions really attached, that money is about to be reoriented to pay farmers to restore soil health, catch carbon, recover biodiversity, and improve the purity of rivers. That's an incredible opportunity that's right there, right now. The other thing that was announced yesterday was reform of the fishing, fishing and fisheries policy post-Brexit. Again, a big opportunity for moving towards sustainability. And actually, the big shift, I think, which is now there, and many ministers get this, as well as many academics, is to see how the recovery of the environment is actually about the improvement of the country's well-being, improving our health, wealth, and security. And when it comes to our public health, that's possibly the biggest, biggest issue of all. If you look at the statistics regarding some of the long-term health challenges we have in this country, especially the long-term tendency towards more psychological illness, one of the things that we know that we can do is provide for more access to natural areas. That's a choice, probably a more positive one than prescribing more and more antidepressants. And again, a very big literature out there showing how we can reposition the environment as a completely different political offer. Recovery of nature, not simply about the recovery of nature, but about our health, security, and well-being long into the future. So we can do all of this, but my many years as a campaigner tells me that as I started, you know, this is not really about the science and the data. We have all of that. This is really about the politics and the extent to which the politicians see that all of us are asking for this change of direction. We have ministers in office right now who actually are beginning to do this and they will go so much further and so much faster if we all join in and back the ones amongst them who can see the need for change. And they are there right now. So please do join in with this campaign. And what nature does for Britain can continue to be a very great deal long into the future. Thank you very much indeed.
Mm. So much, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, that was a really great speech. I'm, yeah, that was really, really interesting. And I think that that has definitely thrown up a lot of issues and a lot of material for debate. Um, so now we're going to move to the next part of the evening, which is the Q&A. Um, so we're going to have a couple of roaming mics, which will be floating around. So if you have a question, please feel free to put up your hand. Um, the event is being recorded and also live streamed, um, just so you know, um, before you ask a question. Um, and I'm actually going to jump in there now to ask a couple of questions myself. Um, so first of all, I'd like to know, Obviously, there are a lot of synergies that we can achieve if we look at the relationships between ecology and also the economy. But I'm worried about um, what's going to happen to parts of nature that we can't prescribe a certain economic value. What's going to happen to the bits of nature yeah. if we can't show that they're valuable? If we are promoting this kind of rhetoric, how are we going to make sure that those um, are being conserved? And... Um, I also wanted to ask you how you think that we can mobilise more people to engage in the green agenda and the sustainability debate in order to put pressure on politicians to do the things that we really need to do, given that the most recent IPCC report and obviously the pressing state of the crisis. Thank you. So, so I'll just begin with a few remarks on, on that very important question, Cornelia, about the... Um, you know, the extent to which we can do the whole job through um, taking an economic perspective, and we can't. It, it, it's, it's not going to do the whole thing. And what we have to do is blend in quite a lot of different approaches into the conservation um, agenda in order to do, to, to do the wider task. And so what Cornelia is getting at, for those of you who are not maybe necessarily seeing the question, is, um, you know, a butterfly that is quite rare and which, um, you know, maybe is declining, it requires some investment of resources in stopping it going extinct. Why would we bother with that when we can't see an economic value for it? Because what I've just described to you, of course, is a practical value. Um, so the answer is that um, it might well need to have attention paid to it in a way whereby there is no economic rationale for it. It's being done for its own sake. But if that butterfly is living in the peatlands where southwest water is restoring the ecosystem for water supply, the job is being done without us necessarily having to make the case for the butterfly, if you get my drift. And I think quite a lot of what we're doing at the moment in making this new case for nature is really about that. So putting back large infrastructure, green infrastructure, into the environment in ways which has got broad practical values for people and you know, almost um, as an, an artefact of that, the wildlife will, will recover um, and begin to, um, uh, well, either recover or not disappear, depending on what wildlife it is. So I, I think there are strong synergies between the two. But what I think we can say for sure is that the traditional conservation approach that we've had, which is exactly that, trying to stop things disappearing or to bring them back because they're beautiful and because we care about them, it hasn't worked and it isn't working, and its principal tools have been protecting small areas of natural habitat or trying to restrict different activities or trying to protect particular species from particular threats like collecting. And all of those things have been positive but not sufficient. And so what we have to do is take a much broader view, which I think embeds the, uh, the ecological discussion much more into the economic one. Because, you know, what I started with this evening, you know, we've basically taken this view that nature, you know, we have to regrettably but inevitably destroy it because we need to have a growth economy. If you can say, actually, the only way you're going to have any kind of an economy is by recovering nature, it completely changes the terms of the discussion. So that's why I think we do have to talk about this stuff, but it's not the only thing we have to talk about. So the other thing was about how do we get people engaged? Yeah, how do we make people how do you make people care? Um, I don't think you can make people care. I think what we can do is we can share interesting information with them and hope that they are inspired to um, start changing their views. Because um, I think a lot of this stuff comes from within. And I, I don't think you can get people, you, you can't tell people to care about something. And actually, if you do tell people to care about something, very often they, they object to that. Because it, you, you're telling them their values are not right or their values are wrong. And so I think quite a lot of what we have to do is about opening people's eyes and encouraging them to start seeing things differently rather than telling them that something they thought was actually the wrong thing. So you put people's backs up. Actually, I think a lot of what the willingness around 
climate change denial over the last 10 years was that. People being told they were bad for going on aeroplanes and you know, having different kinds of lifestyle choices. You know, it's true, that's all high carbon and it's like very bad for the climate. But I think you can, you can provoke the wrong kind of reaction inadvertently by giving people the information in, in not the best way, as it were. And so I think quite a lot of that climate change denial that was being carried by the newspapers, a lot of people believed it because it sounded much nicer for the people receiving the information than being told that, you know, the world's going to hell in a handcart, their children were going to die and it was their fault. They didn't want to hear that. They'd much rather hear it wasn't true. And so, you know, it's a question of how we present this stuff in order to get the right kind of reaction in terms of taking action. And again, you know, a, a lot of this discussion around the value of nature for the economy, you get a very different reaction from decision makers in business and government when you tell them the kind of stories I just told you about the water supply and the pollinators than if you tell them that they've got to regulate an industrial practice out of existence because of its damage it's causing to bumblebees. So it's all about how the message lands, actually. And in fact, I think probably the, 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 the most underestimated discipline in the whole environmental debate is psychology and the extent to which people react to information in different ways, different kinds of framing of information. So if there's any psychologists in the room, um, this is um, a, an important piece of work for you to do, please, is to work out what the right answer is to Cornelia's question. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I'll open up to the floor. Does anyone have any questions? Please raise your hand if you do. Yeah, we'll go to the man there in the check shirt. Yeah. Yes, same here. <laughs> Tony, thank you very much for the good news about Brexit. It was worth coming this evening just for that, to be yes. perfectly honest. It's it's surprising, isn't it? First, first bit I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing, just to add to your conversation, I mean, why not take a leaf out of the Jesuits' book and get them young? Yes. Isn't it children who would... Aren't they the best persuaders of their parents to behave yeah. in ways that we might want them to do? I mean, they, they've done yeah. a great deal, it always seems to me, about you know, yeah. recycling. You know, don't throw that away, Dad. It's supposed to yeah. go into the green bin, blue bin, whatever. No, I couldn't agree more in, in terms of the importance of um, younger people in all of this. Um, yeah, WWF, we, we, we invest a fair amount of our resources into an education program. We're just looking at that at the moment and how we might do more with that. There's a couple of things that I think um, we should uh, think about a little bit. And, uh, you know, quite a lot of what goes on when you start thinking about young people is education and trying to, you know, give them information. That's good. I think another thing we might want to think about is how we can mobilise young people to be more active politically and, you know, making the case to people um, for change. And then the other bit is about how we can actually start changing the national curriculum and what ministers are putting in place. So in Norway, for example, you know, kids, as a matter of government policy, they're taken out and they go to the seaside and they go out in the snow and the rain and they have a very different view of nature as a result of this. And as a result of that, over many decades, their country is completely different in terms of how its policy is conceived. Nature's at the heart of what they want to do. I mean, they're a petro economy, so they've got some challenges there. But nonetheless, you know, they, um, they, they all go out in all weathers. Uh, because they're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're culturally attuned to it. So there's something there, I think, for, from the point of view of policy. I, I have to say, though, that the, um, you know, the, the, it, 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 this is probably the, the key group for the environmental community right now has to be the under 30s and even the under 20s in terms of how we're going to get the big political changes needed in the next couple of decades or hopefully much quicker than that. And one thing that we should be encouraged about is what happened after the 2017 general election. And I, I think you can see uh, a, a stronger interest in our governing party right now in the environment as a result of their post-election analysis, um, which showed that they didn't do as well as they hoped with younger voters because they weren't seen as particularly green. And so if you look back to the 2017 election, we've had announcements about the phase out of the internal combustion engine. We've had an uplift in our climate change targets. We've had um, discussions about environmental ambition post Brexit. We've had loads of announcements about plastic, none of which was evident before the election. And I think one of the things that came back from the analysis is that the young voters are only gonna vote 
for parties that have got a strong green agenda. So I think the politics is already beginning to change as a result of the youngsters beginning to change and to engage with politics. So I think the more we can get youngsters to know about this stuff and be inspired by it, and then to start thinking about how they're going to vote, then um, that's really quite important. And actually, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, couldn't help thinking that, like, you know, right now, the next election might be 2022, um, so, you know, three and a half years away, which means probably a key target group for us right now in the environmental community would be 15-year-olds who will be voting for the first time in 2022. And so you can kind of, you know, you can see this group of people who need to be mobilised as, you know, teenagers to their 30s, I would say. Um, but obviously, you know, the more we can get this into primary schools, the better, including through the kind of like Scandinavian route where everyone's going out and being in the natural environment. We've seen them in Norway, I must say. Kids in Karagul's building sandcastles. It's, uh, yeah. it's a joy to behold. Thank yeah. you. Anybody else? Or someone? Yeah. Are you there? I think it should be already on. Is it on? Yeah. Oh, good. Um, my name is Lisa Foster. I'm a partner in Richard Buxton Environmental and Public Law. So we have spent 30 years campaigning for sound environmental decisions. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if you know the work we do. But I know we Richard. Are, I know, we yeah. are the claimants, solicitors. Yeah. People have something coming in their neighborhood they're opposed to and they come yes. to us. And I, I wanted to pick on two points you said. The first one is, you talk about the politicians. Mr. Freeman put his neck out over a case I was involved in in North, North Norfolk, so the decision maker is Norfolk County Council. It's a waste site adjacent to a river, which is an SAC, couldn't have the highest, highest level of yeah. protection. And what we're seeing is a ministerial level support for the environment and total neglect at the decision making stage. Yeah. And it really, it is, inconceivable to the general public how many bad decisions are being made because the councillors vote for waste facilities adjacent yeah. to a sensitive river environment. And on the back of that problem, I don't see how you're gonna get a 15 year old or a 22 year old, my son who's 21, to engage in local elections so that they can really root out the problem. And we ask, 100 cases a year probably to be called in so that somebody with a better level of thinking capacity and a little <coughs> greater awareness of environmental issues will make a decision on the planning application, they don't get called in. So your, your destiny is dependent on the county councillor level and the inspectorate level is another problem. And on top of that insurmountable challenge, which we cannot stop, we can judicially review decision after decision after decision, but it's very hard once the decision's been made to turn the clock back and get a, a quashing order so that somebody can rethink the environmental harm they're proposing. You get Natural England, who is the government's body, trusted with protecting the environment, sending a consultation response in saying, not a problem. And I've had a hydrologist send in consultation responses saying there's a serious risk of pollution runoff and what the Environment Agency in Natural England is saying is wrong. I don't, I don't know how we can change the debate on the incremental damage. It's not happening in the, it's the microcosm that's leading to the deteriorated state of the environment. It's decision by decision by decision. Yes. And it, it, it's local politicians who don't care, aren't educated, and it's natural England who do not take a robust approach. And as soon as a local planning authority is, is faced with a planning application where natural England has said, we don't see a problem, they, they, they turn off, they, they sign off, they don't listen. And so that's, those are the two on the ground, front line, customer facing problems that need to be addressed. And I don't know where you could fit into that dialogue, but until there's a change on those two fronts, you're gonna see incremental damage, planning decision by planning decision by planning decision. 
That's my point. So you're and I don't know it. where you I don't know where no. you start addressing so, those. So you're problems. close to this. What would you say would be the answer? Or, or what would be the approach that could be taken in the face of First that? of all, you have to replace Natural England's chief executive. Because until you get a head at that organization who really cares, you're not going to get the frontline staff making those consultation responses that say, actually, we've got a problem with that. We want to stop that housing here. We don't want that waste site near the River Wensum SAC. You need Natural England to do its job. I'm sorry to say that. I have said it publicly in court papers. It doesn't matter what I say. It means somebody has got to put the pressure on getting the right head of Natural England and the Environment Agency. These, these organizations have kowtowed to the government because they're afraid they're going to lose their funding. As soon as they feel at risk, they're, they're scared. They won't take the tough decisions. They won't stand up and say, this is a problem. So that's the first thing you could do. How you deal with the local councillors voting at Norfolk County Council or North Norfolk District Council or Brecklin Council, I don't know. Well, um, possibly about getting different councillors and people standing for office and uh, being able to take those decisions differently. I, I think in our country, you know, quite a lot of the time we, we have, we have a, um, a, 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 a lot of disappointment expressed with politicians and then not many of us willing to stand for office. Um, so, you know, maybe we should be encouraging some of those 15-year-olds to be thinking about, you know, whether they could be doing that themselves because they've got the biggest stake in all of this and, you know, in their 20s and 30s, maybe getting onto some of those um, elected bodies would be, you know, one way of changing things. When I pitch up in front of planning committees and give, a, a, you know, a, a claimant's objection or a view from the local community that we're acting for, I don't see any young faces there. No, exactly. No, so that's, the, that's the thing, isn't it? And so maybe that is a, a <clears> way of growing a decision-making body who really cares about the decisions they're taking. Yeah, one would hope so. Anyway, those are my the thoughts. other thing to change would be the planning law, of course, and the extent to which there's clear guidance coming from central government on some of these things. And that was, uh, that was rolled back as well during the coalition government era, wasn't it? The... Uh, the planning system slimmed down to a much less robust set of uh, demands than was previously there. The policies, the policies are there. Okay. The policies Good. and the protections are there. It, the voting members don't, don't apply them properly. That's the problem. So it's a political problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, we've got one at the back. Hi. So, um, yeah, what do you think about like what people call like rewilding? Because like when you talked about the um, restoring like Dartmoor and like the water and stuff, I was really surprised you didn't mention beavers, because like, yep. they've actually been reintroduced to like a small enclosure like down in yeah. Devon, haven't they? Yeah. And like, they've had like a really positive effect on the the yeah. water, like you know, filtering out pollutants yeah. and like slowing down the flow of flood water and stuff. Yeah. So you know, you know, what's your stance on that? Do you think we should reintroduce more of those species or not? Yes, I do. I was really surprised you so, didn't mention um, that. Yeah. yeah, trouble is trying to condense. Um, several years' worth of work into 45 minutes, and so beavers actually were on my list, but I didn't quite get to them. Um, so, so, so the beaver um, it, it, it is indeed uh, a very important animal from the point of view of quite a lot of what I talked about this evening. And, uh, you know, in, in the context of this discussion about rewilding, there is this component which is about the practical benefits of that, and the beaver is a very good example and so, actually, um, uh, there was a visit. It's not in this book, actually, but um, I did go to a visit uh, to an enclosure with beavers up on Dartmoor um, a couple of years ago where there's some experimental work going on to try and understand the effects of those animals in the top end of a catchment. So a lot of the nutrients and um, soil that's coming down into the bottom of rivers, it's coming from quite high up. And so this experiment was basically trying to understand the effects of beavers in the top end of a catchment on a small little river that was running down. And so what had happened was that the Devon Wildlife Trust had enclosed uh, an area 200 metres long and like 100 metres wide around this piece of upland uh, watercourse. And they put in at the top of the watercourse sensors to manage the nutrients and sediment coming into the beaver enclosure 
and at the bottom end had put in sensors to measure what was going out. And the beavers, they'd built 13 dams between these two sensors and thereby created 13 quite substantial ponds, one of which was a small lake. And they changed the tree cover to basically um, coppice from big trees, lots of vegetation low down, a completely different ecosystem to what was lying around it, completely created by the beavers. And amongst many other things, one of the ecological changes that had come with that was that the flow rate at the bottom of the um, dams where the beavers had built, there used to be a flood peak that went like that every time it rained. The water would go up and then go down again. And basically it was going like this after the beavers had been active in the area. So basically they'd taken the tops off the flood peaks and if you did that across the top of the catchment, you get that following all the way down. So basically what they were doing was moderating water flow in ways which would be very important from the, from the perspective of flood risk reduction. The other thing that they'd done is they were stripping out all the nutrients. So the sheep and cattle that were in the upper catchment that were defecating on the hillside, the nutrients in that were getting into the little streams, but the beaver dams were stripping it all out because the vegetation basically was stripping all the nutrients as it was passing through. And so there's, you know, there's people around at the moment who are advocating rewilding and beavers very much um, a part of that. And there are now a couple of populations established in the UK. There's one quite near to there on the River Otter, confusingly, uh, where there are beavers. And um, there um, are animals being released there now to diversify the, the genetic pool. And I think I'm, there's 50 in that river now, I think, beavers, and they're doing very well. And on the River Tay in Scotland, population of several hundred. And, uh, you know, both of those actually were... Um, illegal releases. Somebody's been putting these things back out and they've taken very well. Uh, but there's official trials going on uh, also in Scotland, one in Wales, trying to gather more information about this before we go to scale. But I think there's, you know, there are dozens of catchments across the British Isles that would benefit from beavers being in them. And you know that's one animal. Another which I think we should look at seriously as a country uh, to reintroduce, because it was here until a couple of thousand years ago, is the lynx. So this is a pretty big cat that used to occur across Britain. It was exterminated, and uh, as a result of that, the woodlands uh, that we do have are very different to how they would have been because of the predation of deer. Those animals, they're, they're roe deer specialists, and they would keep the deer population down. A lot of the reasons linked to bird decline and some insect decline in British woods at the moment apparently is linked to deer grazing and the extent to which we've got many more deer than naturally would be the case. And so putting back some of those predatory animals potentially could be interesting too. But there are people doing this stuff now, rewilding in, in different forms. And so, um, you know, we're, we're getting, as I described earlier, you know, examples of things that we know work. We're now getting to see some examples of how that can work with different kinds of approaches. So very exciting, actually, the whole rewilding piece, and certainly at the front line of conservation in this country now. All right, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, anyone else? I think we have time to squeeze one last question in, if anyone has a, a burning question that they want to ask. Any questions? Yeah, there's one over there. Hi, uh, thanks for that talk. It was uh, fantastic. Uh, you mentioned quite a lot about the Westminster politics, and I just wondered if you saw anything interesting happening in the devolved um, governments, for example, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, yeah. which tries to draw local authorities yeah. into the picture. Yes, there's a lot going on, and um, actually, you know, the, 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 the politics of the British Isles are going to be very different post-Brexit because of the um, way in which, you know, the common standards that were there before with the EU are going to be withdrawn, and we're going to have you know, diff probably a divergence of approach across, across the countries of, of the UK. Um, and hopefully what we'll have is, you know, healthy competition with, you know, countries leading and others catching up. So potentially some positive things that could come from this, including the kind of step that's been taken in Wales with the Future Generations Act, which is very forward-looking, um, which is now really about implementation and how to... Uh, actually do, you know, the things in there which are effectively about sustainable development and in a, in a good way. Um, but in Wales, 
Um, you know, we have a parallel agricultural policy reform going on alongside what's happening in Westminster. In Scotland, there's a new Climate Change Act being debated, potentially taking the target there to, you know, a 1.5 degree pathway in, what the, in line with what the IPCC just said. Um, my colleagues north of the border, RSPB and others, trying to get the Scottish Government to talk about a new Environment Act there as well. So um, I think you can see mirrors of, you know, different faces of it. It's going at different speeds depending on, on the agendas. Uh, but the same issues, plastic, carbon, nature, you know, they're all there in different ways. And as I say, you know, hopefully what can happen is that Wales can go ahead and then we can get England to catch up and then Scotland can do something and the other two can, can follow that. Which actually, from the point of view of the campaigning work we do, is, is a very um, fruitful uh, area, potentially, for us over, over the coming years. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so that's the end of the evening's proceedings, but please do feel free to make your way into the main concourse and get a glass of wine and have a chat to Tony um, and pick up a book. And um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you, Cornelia, for organising. Thanks for coming. Thank you. And yeah. please join me. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> thank you. really came from me.